Thank you for joining us here at Miriam's Motherhood Center. We're ready to begin with Mrs. Connie Wolf. Just want to um, point out that the classes, the series until now, including this evening, is Lili Nishmas, um, Reb Yitzchak Ben, ben Reb Aaron Floor. There's Nishama should have an Aliyah. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. All right, hi everybody, welcome back. Um, we have handouts here, they're also, whoever's watching on Zoom, they're on the erbintyra.org, you can find the handout there. Uh, we're at Raising Hashem's Children and we're up to part four. Um, and I'm very excited, our topic for tonight, we called Pride and Peer Pressure. Um, and by that I mean, one of the things that we deal with um, ourselves always, and increasingly as we're raising children and they get older, we, we would like to be the ones that determine for them what their values are, but we notice pretty quickly that there are lots of other people around them in the world. Um, there are, first and foremost, their friends, their friends, friends in class, friends on the block. There are other extended family members. There are, you know, just people they see. Um, and something that I think all parents grapple with, no matter where they're coming from, at some point is, how do I help my child live uh, the values that I want for them, as opposed to just sort of be schlepped along by the winds of whatever's happening around them? Um, in other words, how do I help them stand up to peer pressure, right? And we all have our line of what we feel is okay, right? But everyone deals with this. At some point, something is not in line with the values I want for my child, and then what? So I wanna start from a general perspective on the concept of pride in Yiddish guide and its importance. And then we're gonna to try to break down like a few specific areas in which we can concentrate and help build our children's pride and confidence and values against the peer pressure around them. So the Rebbe points out something very interesting and that is that in, in the Shulchan Aruch, right in the beginning, right, nothing's an accident, the order that it's in. We start off with Shabbis Hashem Lenegi Samid, right, the foundation of Yiddishkeit as we spoke in last class is Yerush Shemayim, the Abishur is watching at all times. Like we start with that. And pretty much right afterward, this is Simon Aleph Se'if Gimel. So where it's literally like right in the beginning, just after talking about a recognition of Hashem in the morning, um, the Shulchan Aruch, the Kitzvah Shulchan Aruch quotes the Perkyavis, the mission of Yehuda ben Tema, uh, where he says, be bold as a leopard, light as an eagle, etc." And we're gonna focus on just az kanamer. What does it mean to be bold as a leopard? What does it mean to be bold as a leopard? Don't be embarrassed, don't be intimidated by people who mock and make fun of your Vedas Hashem. And the Rebbe notes that this is in the beginning of Shulchan Aruch for a reason, because we start off with what is Yiddishkeit serving the Abishter. We're going to get to the details of what that looks like and what the various mitzvahs are and how to do that. But there's something in the way before we start talking about how to serve Hashem. And that is this very big, what could feel like a monster, sitting there at all, the, at all times, which is peer pressure. And we can know what's right we could really care to do the right thing and we could know what we're supposed to do. And in the middle, there's this big feeling of, but what are people gonna think, right? And, and that just gets, it just hijacks us in the middle of the road and goes no further, stop right there. Like you cannot dare um, be an outcast and fill in the blanks, whatever number of words, you know, get used in society. but. You know, you have to be normal. You have to be liked. You have to be accepted. You're gonna you just, you're gonna lose your friends. People are gonna think you're nuts. Um, whatever's gonna happen because of that. And like, you can't afford to do that. And it's natural that we care. Like, I think if we didn't care, we'd be 
I mean, we should be concerned. You know? I, the way Hashem created human beings, we should be concerned if someone couldn't care less what people think of them naturally because they're probably lacking something socially. I mean, it, Hashem created us as, uh, the Rebbe uses the word medini, uh, a human being is a social being. He's created to be around and with other people, to need them, to need relationships. And that's what draws us closer to each other. We need each other. And it has a lot of positive sides to it. That's where families built from and lots of other wonderful things. And yet it gets in our way when it controls us, when we don't get to choose the, I guess, the nature and the terms of relationships. And it's rather like this overarching need to be accepted that just rules my life. Um, and so the, what Zulchan is telling us is yes, you know, you have people in your life, you care about them, and you might even care to be accepted by them, but make sure that doesn't interfere in your body. Figure out a way to work on the resilience of, I care about other people, I care about them, but I don't care what they think of me. And that's a lifetime of idea we all have. And like everything in Chinuch, um, what we want for our children always starts with ourselves. And we'll talk about that. But the question for tonight really is how can, how can we help build this in our children that they should care less what other people think and therefore allow the space for caring what Hashem thinks because it's really one or the other. Um, okay, so on the topic of chinuch to ganyachiv, to Yiddish pride, to confidence, right? My life is not dictated by others. Um, I serve the Abister only. Uh, the Rebbe says something very powerful about peer pressure in parenting. Based on the Parsha Kedoshim, in Parsha Kedoshim, we have here in the second source, in the, Pasuk, the same Pasuk says as follows. It says, Ish imoi. Sorry, the first thing it says is Kedoshim to you, right? To be Kedosh. First is Kedoshim to you, and then it follows in the same passage with saying, Ish tiro, a person, a man should have Yira, right? We described last time as awe and respect for his mother and father. So you have in one pasuk, be holy, be Kaddish, and imoiv tiro. The Rebbe draws a connection. I'm going to read in the Rebbe's words here. The first educators of a child, of a person, are his mother and father. Die Mutter und der Vater darf nach reinbringen in die Kinder, dem Gefühl, als sie sein und anders von der ganzen Welt. The role, the responsibility of parents is to instill in the children this very deep sense, this feeling that they are different from the whole world. They sind Mitglieder von Agai Kaddish, they they are part of this awesome, incredible, holy nation that Hashem chose for himself. Before I continue, what does Kaddish mean? Kaddish has two meanings that are intertwined. Kaddish means holy, but Kaddish also means separate. And that's why a marriage in Yiddish guide is called Kiddushin, Harayat Mikudeshasli, or separated to me. What makes a marriage holy is that it's separate, that the relationship is um, set aside only for one person and therefore it becomes sanctified, it becomes holy. So um, the, the message to children, the message to every yid is kedoshim to you. What does Hashem want from us? To recognize that we are kedoshim. We're different. We're not like everybody. We're not like the rest of the world. I've chosen you from everyone else. You know, at this point in the world, there are, let's say, close to 8 billion people. And out of those almost 8 billion human beings on the planet, there are only, we don't really know for lots of reasons, but let's estimate somewhere in the 15 million range that are Yidin. That's a tiny percentage and has always been, right? One lamb amongst 70 wolves. It's, we are separated from everyone else. says, like I've chosen you amongst from everyone else to be like my special, treasure my special nation, and to live a holy life, to live a life that is ruchniistic, that is kikadosh ani, just like Hashem is kadesh, requires that we first recognize that we're different. 
that we're separate, that we're special, that we're not everybody. And often it's easy to forget this as much as we know, like, yeah, in lifestyle, we have to be different. We happen to be different. We do things differently, but there's a natural feeling of like, but I want to fit in. So if someone's going to say from you are really weird, you know, and all kinds of things about orthodoxy and blah, 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 and they're this and they're that, and enough of your cold ultra-orthodox and they're really weird. And whatever we're going to hear people say, like the natural reaction is to go, hold on, no, 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 we're normal. <laughs> I'm going to prove to you, we're normal. We are. We, 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 we are not weirdos. Um, and the message really of the Ein Yaakov, of Yiddish pride is, first of all, what defines normal and who says you need to fit in? Fit in with whom? You're a guy Kaddish. You're not schooling. You're different. You're special. Your whole holiness, everything is the fact that you're different. So why try to fit in? We shouldn't be trying to fit in, right? We'd lose our whole mission, our whole special mission and lifestyle and identity and purpose here in this world if we start thinking we're just everybody else who just happen to have certain extra mitzvahs. You know, it's sort of like the, I know we need to dress a certain way because of the lachas v'tzniyas, but like, why does it make us stick out like sore thumbs? Like, let's figure out how to be tzniyas and fashionable. Like, that's not to say people can't look, you know, with a program and have to look like they're outdated, right? But there's this need somehow to reconcile what well, the halachas of terror make me stand out. So how do I minimize the standing out? Well, who said we have to? Like, why, why, why do we care so much? And again, that's not going to disappear overnight. And it's not like we could just tell ourselves, poop, stop caring, um, right? But to the ex- we have to recognize that to the extent that we care, about um, to the extent that we care about fitting in with whoever it is, to that extent, we lose the ability to be strong in our own values, right? Hashem put us here in this world, why? Why are there only 15 million or so given amongst the billion by and why? Because Hashem, we are his ambassadors here in this world, like Avram Avinu, that it says by Hashem b'shem Hashem kalel and called the name Hashem and the Mepharshim say al tikra vayikra el vayakri. Don't just say he called the name Hashem. Read it vayakri. He made other people call. Avram Avinu's mission was to stop strangers in the desert and get them to thank Hashem. Right. Our, our purpose here in this world, why did Hashem put us here, not to um, just make it through life and try to blend in, but specifically to have a different purpose and bring everyone to us, not to blend into them, to get them to get the rest of the world to recognize there is an Abish there and to live, um, like the Rebbe says, Alfie said, a Yashur, a righteous, just, kind life and turn the world into a home for Hashem. To do that, we need to feel um, comfortable, first of all, with our difference and then proud of it. And this is the responsibility that I was saying of the parents. The parents are the ones who give a child the sense are we comfortable with our identity? Do we know what our identity is? And are we proud of it? And there are many levels of identity. Um, I don't want to get into all of them because it's going to take us all night, just that. Um, you know, but just as a, a, a sort of a springboard for thought, and each of us probably struggle in a different level of it. Um, as Yidin, as Chassidim, there are many levels of identity we want to impart to our children and help them feel proud of. So first and foremost is that we're Yidin. Sorry. Um, first and foremost, as Yidin, we have, um, right, we want our children to recognize that you're a Yid, a Yid is different than everyone else. It's special to be a Yid, and we can't take for granted that our children know this. Maybe Yiddish guide is a burden, Maybe it just, I don't know, we have to be born like that, and we have to do certain things, and, you know, the rest of the world probably has it easier. I don't, you know, they can think lots of things. Um, So first of all, we want to ask ourselves, like, are we imparting, we'll talk about how, um, a strong sense of identity that Ashrena Matev Chalkeinu, we're proud that we're Yidin, um, that we are part of this Goy Kaddish that Hashem chose. That's number one. Number two, um, if you're on this class, then we're probably trying to raise children that, you know, from from a, not just they should be proud that they happen to be Yidin, but that they keep Torah and Mitzvahs. Um, where they see many Yidin around them who unfortunately maybe a teenage Shanishba may not know, may not have the kind of chinuch they have and are not keeping the mitzvahs, make a look around them. 
whether we officially live on shluchus or not, right? You're going to encounter Yidin around you. I mean, we all struggle. None of us are perfect, right? But who outwardly don't seem to be living a life of terror and mitzvahs. And children may come to think like, well, they don't. So why do I have to? Like, we just have all these restrictions we're careful about, but like, it seems there's another way to live. So we want our children to feel proud that um, we keep Torah mitzvahs. We take it seriously. It, it, it matters in our life. Um, and again, we'll talk about how to deal with everyone else who doesn't, um, but they should feel comfortable and happy and proud with them being from. Um, furthermore, we want them to be proud of their chassidim, right? They're a chassid. We learn chassidus. Chassidus is important to us. We follow the limud chassidus and the darkei chassidus. It, it's not just like it happens to be, right? A chassid recognizes it's not just like, oh, there are different ways of being. And yes, with all the respect and appreciation for all different ways of serving Hashem, we do believe that the Baal Shem Tov had an alias neshama as he himself related, uh, where the Baal Shem Tov's neshama went up to Shemayim and met Mashiach and said, when are you coming? And Mashiach told the Baal Shem Tov, I'm waiting for your wellsprings, for your teachings about Pnimis Atayra to penetrate the world. In other words, the teachings of Chassidus are not just another nice Torah, they're, they're critical. They are the Torah that we will learn when Mashiach comes. They are the Torah that everyone needs to learn now. And we've been given a privilege that we have access to it, that we have Chassidus, that we are striving to live by it. Um, I want our children to feel proud of that. Again, I'm gonna break down all of those in terms of what we do with that and how, how we transmit those, right? Just in terms of goals. Um, even more specifically, that they're Lubavitcher Chassidim, that they have a connection to the Rebbe, the Nasi Adar, um, which includes, of course, it's not just a label, right? What does it mean that we're Lubavitchers? What does it mean to what does it mean to live as a Lubavitcher? Um, what does it mean that we are Chassidim of the Rebbe? Who is the Rebbe? And do we really value and appreciate that? Or is it just, you know, there happens to be a Rebbe picture on the wall? Um, and finally, I would add that every single family has their own uniqueness, has their own certain standards that they're looking to impart. Um, whether it's a lifestyle that we, um, you know, were involved in, the parents, let's say, were involved in chinuch, were involved in play kaidesh, right, or whatever, shluchas, where there are some passions and like Yiddish um, avoided that we devote our life to, whether it's specific standards that are stronger in the home, kashra, some, um, I don't know, Sdaka, we're very Mahadere and Hachnasus Arachim, right? Like every family's got their, what they say, Zahir Tfei, right? Their, their mitzvahs that they're especially strong in and that we hope to, our children will emulate us um, and not necessarily have everyone around them passionate about the same things or as strong in the same thing. So even within Lubavitch, like we have certain things always in our family, whoever our family is, that we hope our children are gonna um, pick up. And if we think about that, that's a lot that we wanna make sure our children have clarity in all of that. Who am I? What do I stand for? What does my family believe in? And how do I feel about that, right? Do I see it as a burden? Do I see it as just, you know, it happens to be there all different ways, you know, sort of pick your choice, do what you want. Um, or can we give our children a, a strong sense of pride that this is who I am, this is who my family is, this is who I wanna be. Um, and even if there are those around me act differently, like I'm confident. I'm going with this. So the Rebbe continues in their Seder Akasov is Imoi Ve'aviv, free or der Moter. When it comes to this Pasuk, as opposed to Kaved Esavicha Ve'asimecha, when it comes to Imoi Ve'aviv Tiro, Imoi is said first. So from this perspective, there are other reasons. Um, but from this perspective, connecting it to Chinuch and Yiddish pride, the Rebbe points out the first comes the mother, because she's the Akaris Abayis, and it's primarily up to her. Why? Because this is a feeling. It's not just a sort of logical, it's on Dvar Tyra, we say, even though it includes that, right? It's, it's, it's an emotional thing, right? And the emotional connection to Yiddishkeit is the mother. How does she feel about the lifestyle she's living, right? A child who grew up, could have two children growing up in homes that have very similar standards, whether it just in terms of keeping halacha, whether in terms of Lubavitch, whether in terms of their on shulchas or their on or their or whatever it is, right? We could be technically doing the same things, but what kind of attitude is the mother giving over? 
Is she giving over Ashrena Matev Halkenu? It's so special, it's so wonderful, what a privilege. Or is there this, you know, schlepping and I, and why do we have to, whether we say it, we don't say it, you know, but you radiate this kind of like heaviness and the pronounce is so difficult and I, and, you know, we spoke about this in the second class about Avos Hashem, Avos Terra, Avos Yisrael, like are we radiating a positive attitude towards the image that we're giving? We're not, of course, we don't gravitate to the positive. Um, so this is one of those things. It, it's a feeling we give, a feeling of strength and confidence and pride and happiness that the children are picking up primarily from us. So it's really up to us as mothers, no matter. Um, and I, I think it's an empowering message because we might think like, oh no, who, who knows what might happen? I mean, they're gonna send them to school. I'm, there are kids on the block. There are I'm moving wherever I live. There are other people like, how can I control what's gonna to happen to my kids? So of course we can't control it. And we always need Ziyatha Deshmaya, we need a Davin, we say their capital. Etc. But there actually is a lot we can do. It's, it's not like it's all up in the air and it's like we have no idea how to get our kids to like there really is. It's so much primarily up to the mother, um, the identity that the children have and their confidence in that. So I want to look at a few specific areas that we can concentrate on and think about that can help build uh, going out of Yiddish pride in all the areas that we just spoke about in a healthy way for our children. The first one I want to start with is values. Um, meaning before we talk about pride, the question is, do our children even have clarity? Do they know who we are, why, and what's important about that? You know, often we assume our children have picked things up by osmosis. They might have, they really might not have. Um, and often we, it's, it's sometimes it's especially when a peer pressure situation comes up that we realize like, wait, I thought my child should know this, but like, how should they? Why would they know this? And it's never too late. Like that can be a wake up call. Am I actually sharing my values? Um, you know, I recently had several such incidents. In one particular case, one child came home with something that wasn't even bad. It was just like something that a friend wanted to do that was just so not what we value in our home, it was so not our way of looking at things and doing things. It was like, wait, how did you not get that? How did you not get that your parents are so passionate about like just navigating life in a different way that you even thought of doing that? And then I had to stop myself and say like, wait, why should she? It's not her problem. If like, she doesn't know what you're doing. She doesn't know what her parents are involved in and how they deal with anything. Like you need to talk about it you know, actually, actually explain it to her. And then of course, Dukmachai is gonna matter because then she has a Dukmachai and she'll be able to see it. But if you didn't articulate it, not necessarily does she know it. Um, so the first question is, are we actually imparting our values to our children? Um, one amazing quote here from the Rebbe from his Fadias, Fabrenga Tafshim Dalit, that the Taira Taira's Emes Taira's Chaim teaches us First of all, we need to recognize that, as we said before, the achrayis, the responsibility and the concern for the chinuch of the children belongs, mutelis is, you know, hanging primarily on the parents. The school is only their shleach. The, the, the school is acting on my behalf to help me, just like, you know, we talked about a babysitter, you know, they're, they're my shleach to sort of, I give them instructions or I hand it over a certain mandate, hopefully they're helping me. But it's not their child, it's my child. And therefore, even when we send a child to school, the achrayis, the responsibility for my child's chinuch remains on my shoulders even when they're in school. I think this is, um, a trap many of us fall into, like I can see it happening myself often. Uh, we think like we're paying so much in tuitions. Um, Baruch Hashem, if we have access to chinuch, um, in terms of like from Yiddish schools, so Yiddish schools to send our children to. So there's a sense of like, listen, I've done my duties. You know, we didn't exchange like the altar ever, I pay you, you, you know? usually don't pay enough to actually um, make it work, but whatever, we feel like I, I, I did my thing, so you do yours and I'm good, like I'm good to go. Um, I think in this area, often shluchim who live 
somewhere they need to homeschool and take much more advice for their children's clean up because they know the school isn't whatever the day school, whatever it is, isn't able to, to provide it for their children, sometimes are have an advantage in that they recognize that they really are responsible for the children's kind of, and if they want their children to know something, care about something, be careful with it, that they really have to invest in it. Um, of course, it's still a challenge to do it, but so, the, there's a sense of complacency that happens when we live, I think, somewhere where we have access to from school. So it was like, it's good. I'm sure they're learning it in school. Like, I'm sure they'll teach them whatever it is they need to know. And we just kind of figure, okay, so I can go off and do my thing. I can be concerned with, uh, you know, just making sure they have supper and I get their clothes and whatever. And um, like the chinuch is happening from nine to four. And it's a big mistake because even in the best case scenarios where our children have fantastic teachers who we are so grateful for, um, there's still only so much a child can pick up from school. Ultimately, the deepest sense of who they are and how they should feel about it comes from home. So should I value what my teacher said? Even if, even if my teacher said it, right? Even if the teacher is amazing and teaches like all these incredible things beyond, first of all, they have to teach academics. Like they have to actually teach in terms of Torah. You have to teach the, the psukim. We have to teach the knowledge and the skills and um, hopefully with the passion and with the values, but like they're trying to cover Torah learning. Torah learning and chinuch are not the same thing, right? There's a mitzvah b'shinantam l'fanecha to teach your children Torah. They should know Torah. There actually is such a mitzvah. We'll explore it more in Mitzvah Shem the last class. Um, um, so differently, um, it's a good question. We'll discuss that as well. Uh, chinuch of, uh, Torah learning and chinuch of girls. But there is Torah learning itself and the reasons why we need to learn Torah and which parts of Torah and how much and, and, and the goals of that. That's Vishnantam Levanecha. And then there's the mitzvah of Chinuch, which is training them to be Yidin. They're not the same thing. They're two different things. Um, and the Rebbe says that today, if we're talking to teachers, teachers need to recognize that not necessarily are the children coming from home with Chinuch, and therefore they need to not only be teaching Torah, they have to be given Chinuch as well. They have to be imparting values and Yerushimayim and Abbas Hashem. They have to try their best. But even a teacher's trying their best, it's still, they're still not the parents. Like even the best case scenario, and often the best case scenario is not happening. We shouldn't just assume it is, but even if it is, there's still something that they need to get from home. It's still the parents of Chrayis. They might learn a lot in school, but how do they feel about themselves as Yidin, what, what is really important to them, et cetera. Um, I, I would also point out, though not necessarily are they learning it in school. Often we just assume, maybe they're not. Between each teacher every year and whatever, there, there could be gaps, there could be things our, our children won't learn. Um, and I found it personally, like maybe this sounds a little extreme, but I personally found it helpful to adopt an attitude of like, everything my children get in school is extra. I'm grateful. Like no expectations. Like I, I know it's, it's not an easy pill to swallow, but I think we are setting ourselves up for failure when we look at it as like, okay, the school's going to teach them everything. I'll see what's missing and I'll, I'll deal with it. We're just going to end up disappointed and frustrated as opposed to the children are my Christ. They're kind of as my Christ. If something really matters to me, I have to make it happen. And anything I see happening in school, that's fantastic. So, you know, yes, respect to the teachers and Mahanchem and principals, whoever is investing in that, and we appreciate that. And and when there are no expectations, and we're conscious of our children's chinuf and really asking ourselves, like we talked about the half hour chinuf a day, um, you know, we're keeping abreast of what they're up to and what they need to learn. Then okay, so it's just great. I'm so glad they learned that in school. That's amazing. We just add it in as opposed to being um, totally overwhelmed at some point of like, how did they not pick this up? Because we just kind of left it to somebody else. Having said that, how do we go about transmitting those values? You so, right. So, what, right. We're not doing another homeschool in addition to school. So, what are we doing? Right. Exactly. And we don't have time. So, what are we actually doing? The first thing that I want to point out is something that I think is really fundamental. Um, in on all levels of chinuch, the Rebbe speaks in Tavshin Lamed Dalid. This is from Sifas Kaidesh um, about the Shabbos table, uh, the importance and the kind of the centrality of the Shabbos table in the um, the life of a Yiddish family. And I think if we recognize that and milked it, really took advantage of Shabbos the way it should be. Um, we, we could, no matter where we're starting from, we could really do accomplish so much. Reb describes how during the week, the father's busy with his thing. 
the mother's busy with hers, the children are busy with theirs. Hopefully they're all good things, right? He's he's doing this about his Hashem, she's doing that about his Hashem, they're going to school learning entire. Everyone's doing good things, but they're all in separate places, right? With separate people and running about their own lives. And we don't need to harp on the idea that's pretty obvious that in today's world of technology, that just makes it even worse, right? Everyone's just, so long as you have the weekday, no matter how hard we're trying, there is a lot of just separation going on and everyone's off to their own thing. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. We should be trying to make family time during the week and we should be trying to eat suppers together and we should be trying to put away our phones and, and all of that. But there's there's an element of, of people have things to do, right? We have life. We still have to, right? We have to keep the family running and they're all, all different children, hopefully, and then the supper to make and there's laundry to do and then the father has to work. And like, you know, no matter how, how, how well-meaning you are, children are in school, um, as they get older, they're there for even longer hours. They've got homework. People are busy. And healthy chinuch, the Rebbe says, depends on a home. It's all about the home. I think we saw that during Corona. Uh, lots of things can be done in different ways. We've learned that we can do shiurim on Zoom. That's been a nice lesson. But there are some things you can't replace. Family bonding you can't replace with Zoom. And there's a solution, the Rebbe says in addition to everything else we should be trying. But the, the key solution that has always been embedded in Yiddishkeit is Shabbos. Shabbos, there's no technology, there's no work. There's nowhere to go, nothing to do other than the hours that, you know, not just go to shul or whatever. There's a lot of time, especially Friday night, um, where it's like, they're not running off afterwards anywhere. It's just, we're here. And it's time for family bonding, also for, for couples. Like, it, it's a family bonding time. Rav says, take advantage of this. The beginning of transmitting chinuch in a wholesome way in the home is that we should try really hard that from sort of Friday evening as Shabbos is coming in, but at the very least from, you know, we could start it off in a calm manner, but at the very least from Friday night when the Shabbos actually has come in, the father, the mother, the children should gather together in the same place in the same room at the same table and then use it properly. You know, there's so much created for us. We prepare the food, three courses, because you're supposed to have fish and you're supposed to have meat or chicken and you can't eat them together and so the whole nature of the way Shabbos is set up is it has to take a while so it's literally created for you that there is what to do we've set up a nice shop so we made nice food and it has to take time to eat it so you're there now do what like what's supposed to happen at the Shabbos table discuss politics socialize with friends I haven't seen in a while like all that can happen another time the Shabbos table is the opportunity to talk about Shabbos of things that this will accomplish first and foremost you're creating healthy family bonding we are sitting here together discussing wholesome things meaningful things nice things that apply to everyone and we're all doing it together and since we talked again in class two about like an emotionally healthy foundation for parenting um, this is the beginning of it it is just a family that feels close and bonded um, around the Shabbos table. But especially more than that, here's our opportunity to talk about Shabbos and Yanim. Like the things we want to talk about in a nice setting, relaxed environment. It's not about kids misbehaving and I'm responding and then giving them lectures because they did something wrong. You know, it's not, we're running and kind of just trying to manage them. We're just, we're here, we're present. We're just sitting here enjoying each other's company and we have time to talk. So here's the time to talk about everything that's important to us. Just in a happy, nice, pleasant context. And therefore the Rebbe says this, this dynamic, this healthy, bonding, um, inspiring dynamic carries over to the rest of the week. Like we're, we're a family that sits and has nice, meaningful conversation for a few hours at the Shabbos table. I've heard from some shluchim that, you know, this is a challenge. Uh, many of us do the incredible mitzvah of having guests and um, part of, thank you. And part of it is um, includes shluchos, whether we're officially in shluchos or not. Um, and it's a challenge. It's like, hold on, Shabbos is my busiest time. So even when we um, are fortunate to have, to have this close that we are able to share Yiddishkeit with others and do machnas ayra uh, on Shabbos, 
um, still an answer that I've heard from some shluchim is designate one, like choose one of the meals of Shabbos to be like a more shluchas for others and one focused more on family. Like let the children have that at least whatever, whichever one works better, night or day, but have that one su'uda that's primarily, even if there are some guests, but primarily about the children and geared to them and in conversation with them and really centered around um, what's gonna be meaningful for them. And there are so many ways of doing this, uh, like what actually happens, we're not sitting there giving a class, but I wanna read, um, I wanna discuss this further, uh, from another letter of the Rebbe, the Rebbe is actually talking to a school, but I think it's very telling here about how to deal with values that are coming in that you don't want, right? Um, right, someone mentioned here besides partial seeing their crafts, we're going to discuss all of those. Uh, so before I get to the practically of what we're doing, um, the Rebbe's talking to a school where, you know, there are certain behaviors coming up, children are doing things, but you don't want them to do, et cetera, et cetera. And like, what's the way to deal with it in a Lubavitcher derech? Reb says not like the not like the Musser way of carrying on about what's wrong with the bad, not about lecturing about how terrible this or that is, but rather the opposite. The emphasis is in elevating the good and talking about how important and valuable and special the good is. On Pashat Giret, what do I mean practically? Says the Reb, start bringing with children. At home or in school, push for our brain with them. And I think this is, if we thought of the Shabbos table as such, a, it, it, it could be so much. It's a time to for our brain with our children. What do you do with it for brain in? Of course, that it says in, in a level that is um, relevant to their level. Binyane Sipurim, tell them stories. Stories are, and you see there is, um, I mentioned several times, teachings of the Rebbe and Chinuch. I can't recommend enough that everyone go through the Sefer. Um, so many sources where the Rebbe points out, Friedrich Rebbe points out how central stories are to Yiddish HaChinuch. All the values we want to teach, the best way to teach them is through a story. The Rebbe points out actually how Sefer Bereshis is all stories. A lot of, not just Sefer Bereshis, especially Sefer Bereshis, but uh, a lot of Tyra stories. It's not all that, you know, just a list of rules. The stories aren't just nice, interesting uh, history. Tara is teaching us how to live. The best way to learn how to live is through a story of other people's lives. And you, you sort of bring yourself and the child into that and see yourself there. But what I do in this situation, how, you know, how can I see myself acting? It's the most inspiring and deepest way to reach someone is through a story. Um, and we can do that at the Shabbos table. We can prepare a story to share. We can, um, something we like to do recently, we like to read the uh, Machanayim books, we'll take one and, and read one and discuss it. Uh, but like there's so many versions of them. You know, we'll read, here's my story from Jem. I was telling you how they used to read the Freedom of Beautiful. It's across five years. <gasps> That's amazing. So I'm here to share that they would read the Freedom of Zacharias at the Shabbos table over the course of five years. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. It's, and children are mesmerized. They're just sitting there, they're listening. Everyone's like happy to hear a story. And the richness, right? All the Freedom of that, that's amazing. Like all the writers of the Friedrich Rebbe uh, that are now translated in English, by the way, in many different forms. There's um, uh, from Seichas in English, there's the series The Making of Hasidim, Links to the Hasidic Legacy, Branches of the Hasidic Menorah. There are many others uh, from Friedrich Rebbe's writings. Friedrich Rebbe tells stories like no one else can. And they're just, what does it mean to be a Yid? What does it mean to be a Hasid? Instead of sitting there lectures, we, okay, we're now having a lesson on what does it mean to live a Hasid? What is a Lubavitcher, you know? What does it mean to be from? But you tell a child a story of, I have some of my favorites from the Machanayim books, but like, or, or from the Food Crab stories. So, so many of them are about the mysterious Nefesh brother Yidin. Just, you look at the, I think of like the story of Abba Yudan, if anyone recognizes that story, who's like, who was a wealthy man who lost all his money and is running after the Chacham and like, please let me give Tzedakah, I'll sell half of my field, I still want to give, don't, don't avoid my house. Like he's begging for the opportunity to, to give Tzedakah and like, and Herschel goat, right? Or Herschel Tzig, they're making fun of Herschel goat, Herschel goat, you know, <laughs> carrying around with your goats. And meanwhile, the Vashem sees a halo around him. Why? Because he's spending his life taking care of goats so that he has fresh milk to give to, new mothers and people who are ill and whatever, like the motherhood center, um, trying to support uh, young mothers, right? Like this is, these are the values we grew up on. Like 
what can you do to help another yid? And you can sit there giving a child a lecture, we believe in helping other yidin, and how could you fight with your brother, and how could you... And we just tell them a story, and it's like you lift them to like, this is, these are the values we believe in. These are who we emulate. There are stories about everything, all the Yiddish values, and we just, shop table is just a beautiful time to do it. All the time, they're sitting there, and you could take them to Super Shabbos and tell another story, right? I'm like, oh, Shabbos is just a wonderful opportunity to do that. And there are mentions, uh, not only stories, Nugune Chabad. Nugunim, Nugunim are really, they're, they're inspiring. And, and you can add, of course, the history of Nugunim, what the Nugunim means. But like singing Nugunim, you, between Nugunim and stories, um, it can really be a beautiful for bringing that doesn't feel like a class. It doesn't, you know, you just, a child picks up so much in terms of what, what we stand for. Um, so mentioned here, of course, the way it's set up, Parsha, whatever. What's interesting about Parsha papers is that it starts from a concept that it's a minute that the father at a Yiddish table on Shabbos tests the children on what they learned. Like Tati's busy all week and doesn't have as much time with the children and the children are learning and they're kind of waiting. We're going to come Shabbos and Tati's going to want to hear what we learned. So we have to learn well and sort of impress Tati and show off. And that's a motivation for the children. Um, in recent years, it kind of became like we give a child an official Dvar Tyra. Here are the things to say at the Shabbos table. Read, Dvar Tyra, question is, answer is. And that's fine. But I, I think it's important that we remember what the point of Dvar Tyra is. The point is like, it doesn't have to be that. I mean, the child can share anything. They can share what they learned through Chumash. What was your favorite lesson of the week? What's, some, you know, what's something special you heard in class that you want to share with us? Like the point is really the interest of the parents. We want to hear, what have you been doing in school? What have you been learning in Tyra? I, like, I want to hear. And we express interest and we talk about it and, and we then bring it into discussion and the child's the center of it. I think we think of like the, um, the Seder, the Pesach Seder as a model, gives us a great idea for how to utilize the Shabbos Riyant of Suda when we can. The, the Pesach Seder is, the purpose of it is the Igad to Levinfa, right? It's the night, one night a year, two nights if we're in Kutzlaritz, that we have an obligation to teach our Messiah, to teach who we are and what we believe in and what we stand for towards older. So how do we do that? We have a lot. It's like, whoa, you know, <laughs> once a year, like this is your time to pass on Yiddishkeit. So like, how do you start and how do you ensure the children will be interested? So what does Rechaim do? They set up an interesting dynamic situation that makes the children curious. And you get them to ask. And they start asking questions and now you can start telling them stories. And I think if we think of it like that, like how can we engage our children? How can we start up from what they come with from school, look at their Parsha projects, look at their, have them tell us about it. So what is this and why? And you know, asking some questions, not as like, of course, a child who's getting intimidated, they don't know the questions, you know, do it differently. It's meant to, you know, the child should feel good. They should be getting lots of attention and, and they're so awesome. Like it's fantastic. Um, but right, we're giving the child attention for their Vartai or their Parsha sheet or their project or whatever it is that they're sharing. And we can follow their lead. Like based on what you said, so what do you think that means? Whatever, and, and, and how does it have to do with this? And if we kind of let the child um, feel like the center of the discussion, it's much easier to then share more as opposed to we're sitting there, children must sit there quietly for an hour, thou shalt not move, Tati's giving a lecture, you know? It's more, it's dynamic, it's, it's back and forth, but we can really um, share a lot that way. And of course, not only at the Shabbos table, but you know, whenever they ask a question, that's a great opportunity. You know, we can get threatened like, oh no, you know, my child is coming home with a question. They saw another child uh, do this or say that or whatever, like now what? Great, that's a teachable moment. Again, like the Seder, Vigadita Levincha comes in response to what? To Manashtana. So when the child has a question and they're always going to come up with, right? Or my friend said this, or my friend did that, or blah, blah, can I have? That's an opening to a conversation. Now we might not be able to have it right then. You feel like that's a great question. We should talk about this. Let's find a good time. It can be later in the evening when the other children are in bed. It can be a time that we can, sometime on Shabbos, it can be a time that we are able to squeeze out to give the child special time during whatever, different things work for different people. No judgment, right? But we could find a time somewhere and say, you know, you asked a really good question about, um, you know, other kids said this or other kids are doing that. And why don't we, let's talk about it. And then we can, again, in response to their curiosity and their question, uh, we can for our brain, we can share a story, we can share a value, um, a resource that's really great in that is Laman Yishmu, the weekly for our brain.
Um, so if we're looking up like, wait, what do I tell my child about why it's important to extend ourselves and help another kid, let's say, whatever. So you look up on the weekly for bringing all the archives, you find the topics like that and they've got a collection of sources, a few short sources from Tyra and Chassidus, different places. Um, a few short stories, theweeklyfarbrangen.com, I think it is. Um, also known as Laman Yishmu, but you can get it, to, it either way. Um, but they have like hundreds by now. They give out one each week. And we could also, we could just start with that. Like you give it one for the week, that's what we're doing. Like, I don't know what else to talk about. So great. So like, just that's the topic. They've decided that this week, the topic is, you know, Yiddish of Pride. So we'll talk about Yiddish of Pride. And like the sources are prepared. Like we don't have to feel like, oh no, but I don't know what to say. Like there's so many resources out there. Like just take one and be like, okay, I'm going to work off of this. I'm going to um, not read it like that to our Tyra. <laughs> you know, I'm going to prepare it before, think it over, think of which ones talk to me, which ones I'm passionate about. I'm going to share it in my own words, but I've been given resources. Like here, it's a collection of things you can say on this topic. And then we really have what to, what to talk about. Um, and of course, we go back to the archives if there's something specific, or it could be something came up during the week. We notice a behavior in a particular child that we were concerned about. And we don't want to lecture them in the moment because it's not very effective, but we really feel like we need to strengthen this so we can leave it for that Shabbos. And like, it's not about a lecture to this child. It's just like casually, we end up in a conversation, we find a connection to the Parsha, whatever. We just shared a story and that's how it came up. And if the child see, saw themselves in it, like, great, as long as we're saying it in the positive. Um, how can we be like that? You know, we can point out how the children were like that during the week, whenever we saw a little inkling of them doing some of that media or whatever. Um, but we, we need to our brain with our children. That's how they, at the Vazen, we think of the cumulative effect of Shabbos meals week after week after week, how much we could be sharing with them. Like there's, there's 630 messages in the Torah, right? There's so many medias we want to be imparting. There's so many particular values. There's so many questions that come up and like each time there's something else. And then they know where we stand and how we feel about it. And everything in school is gonna enhance that hopefully, but it's sort of, you know, that's, that's I think the first stand is are we taking the opportunity to really in a wholesome way share values with our children? I want to, uh, before I go on, I wanna mention just a couple more um, ideas that I found helpful. Um, different things work for different people. So if anyone finds this inspiring, um, I'm sharing. Uh, one of the little presents we've taken from this very strange period of time called Corona is that last, last spring, I guess, when we started, you know, when we were all kind of locked up in our homes here. Um, it was the first time in a long time that I experienced like a long shop this afternoon without the kids running in and out and having the train station that is Baruch Hashem or our house in the afternoons, friends and neighbors and whatever. Um, and it was like, we're there. We're not going anywhere. We're not going, you're not going. And it just came to me, Bashkaf brought us this idea, like, wait, we learned for uh, Perky Avis on Shabbos afternoon. So like, let's make a family Perky Avis year. So I sat down my older children, whoever was interested, um, old enough to understand to be interested in wanting to join. Uh, and we had our own Perky Avis year. So we went through the Perky Avis um, and we discussed, and Perky Avis is so, it's like, it applies to everyone on their level. There's so much there in one parrot, you've got like literally suitcases full of life lessons in Yiddish guide. Um, and I would just go through as many missions as we could, and we would talk about them on, on those children's level. And I would th be thinking about like, ha how can it apply to them? And what lessons am I hoping they could take from this? And I might connect it to things that were going on in their lives or whatever. But we tried to just make it interesting. And uh, Baruch Hashem, it really worked out well. So once, once um, things loosened up around here and then friends were coming and going already, it was like, we do this. It was like part of our schedule. And like Baruch Hashem, we've been able to continue doing that even this year, even as it's all that's going on. It's like, okay, now it's time for our Perky Avish year. Um, and I, you know, whoever is able to do something like that, I found it to really be um, a great springboard because basically it's not like I'm sitting there lecturing. It's like, well, the, the next Mishnah says, you know, I'll tell the next Chavir Chacha to Gilam Chaimah. Okay, so let's talk about this. You know, it's just sort of like happens to be the Mishnah and then you get licensed to share all the nice values you want. And instead of it feeling like a response to like something you wanna tell the child off about. Um, so that was one, but like there are many ways to do that. I think there are many, um, if we're in a position to learn for the Chidon with our child, like that's a great way to do it. I know not everyone can. And you know, if, if it's an opportunity a parent has, um, that's a great way to do it. You know, you're going through mitzvahs, there's so much. And it's like, even as you're teaching technically the information they need to know, you can, navigate the conversation wherever you need to. So it's really like just seeing what works in my life, 
How can I manage somewhere, some way? Maybe sometimes it's more overwhelming, sometimes less, sometimes we have more time and sometimes less, but is there some way that in this family we're, we're sharing in a happy, positive, meaningful way our values with our children? That's one. Um, briefly, a few more thoughts. Yeah. Just one. Um, so very, very young kids. I have a two-year-old and sometimes on Shabbos or whatever, I'll make like a, just a menchie's a puppet show. And by now it's like when he says, when he asks something, please, he says like, I'm asking like Yaakov, not like Asa. That's so, so great. At the Shabbos table? No, or in general? Like that's Shabbos great. Puppet shows are whatever. fantastic. That's like such a great, way. you're playing with our children and like making puppet shows for them. That's so, so awesome. Um, using the Parsha, using the Parsha people as menchies or even in general and like, Right. In other words, a lot of it is going to happen during play for spending time playing with our children. We could find creative ways of sort of, yeah, that, yeah, that's a great, that's a great um, idea. Thanks for sharing that one. Okay. So in addition to finding a way that we're sharing our values, um, there's another piece and that is just inherently building our children's confidence. Meaning, um, so here that I have a quote, I'm sure many of us have heard this before. Uh, the Pasuk in Chomot Midbar says uh, that uh, Maish Rabbeinu sent Miraglim, sent spies to Eretz Yisrael to check out how to best conquer Eretz, Eretz Canaan. Like, what's the best way to do it? And they came back saying, we can't. Like, he didn't ask them if, he asked them how. And their justification for coming back with like, we can't do this was Vanehi Be'inenu Kachagavim. The people there are humongous. They're giants. We felt like grasshoppers compared to them. We can't do this. And it's not just us. It's not just we felt like grasshoppers. They also saw us as grasshoppers. There's no way we're going up against them. And so the Rebbe explains uh, here, um, there's, a little, um, there's a little note there in the Hesavis at the end, um, that you know, when we're struggling with things, when there, when there is opposition and conflict and difficulty you know, in our, in our the relevance of our conversation here, when you have issues of peer pressure, the other kids are doing this, they're doing that. So there's a, certainly you've heard about the remes, like there are different levels of interpretation of Torah, but on, on the level of remes, the hint that we learned from we felt like grasshoppers in our eyes, and so too we were in their eyes, therefore, because we felt like grasshoppers in our eyes, that's why we were grasshoppers in their eyes. Like confidence 101, and social dynamics 101 is the children and the adults who become popular and make it socially are the ones who are confident. That's how it works. It's not actually what they have. It's not that they're wealthy. It's not that they have the nicest clothing. It's not that they're smart. It's nothing. It's the fact that they feel like they're awesome. And people gravitate towards that. So, you know, there was a social experiment done, I heard once by a, a teacher in a from school. I hope this, I'm presenting this accurately, but it was something like this. I think it was in a high school where she chose two very popular girls in the high school and had them take like yellow bands and stick them um, on their skirts, like hanging out of their skirts. And the girls started walking around with yellow bands sticking out of their skirts. Within a week, the whole high school was wearing yellow bands on their skirts. <laughs> it's crazy how it happens that just because someone thinks they're so cool, <laughs> so they are. Like, I'm so awesome and I'm the best and whatever I do is just in, so everyone follows. And when we can tune into that and help our children recognize that, it's not, you don't need to have something or do something or be something in order to win friends. You're good the way you are. And if you do want to have friends, right? I shouldn't care so much what people think of you, but if you do want to, in, on any level, you know, be liked or whatever, you're not even going to get it from trying to be a follower, from trying to copy other people. That doesn't get you anywhere. People are looking for confidence. So we want to build up our children's sense of inner worth. Like you're good the way you are. Um, Hashem made you. Where's your confidence come from? Hashem loves you. Hashem put you here in this world. That means there is something you can do that nobody else can do. Tati and mommy love you. Like all that just for who you are. And th that's it. Like, that's just wonderful. You're just, you're wonderful. Um, the Kotzker Rebbe actually says on these same words, something very, 
very typical of the Katska Rebbe <laughs> um, style of Tyrus. He says, Okay, you felt like grasshoppers in your eyes. That's understandable. People have self-confidence issues. We tend to, you know, feel badly about ourselves, whatever. I can understand that. But so too we were in their eyes. What's that your business? What other people think of you? Well, why do you go there? Why are you even thinking what other people think of me? That's a dangerous place to go. Not your business. Who cares what people think of you? Work on what, what, you know, your inner sense of worth that comes from what does Hashem think of me? And like, just tune other people out. Stop asking yourself so much. What do people think of you? Because that's, that's the issue, right? When we're self-conscious, what do you think of me? we invite people to look at us as, as weird, right? We transmit that sort of lack of confidence when it's like, I don't care. I don't care if you think I'm weird. I'm good with how I am. So we, we, we radiate that confidence that actually comes across really well. And I think we can't separate the Anyaka, the Yiddish pride from just basic confidence. We, our kids need to feel resilient and comfortable in their own skin. Um, and not be looking over their shoulder constantly for approval and for fitting in and what do people think of me? And it's hard. It's a lifelong, right? Like it's- It's actually very normal. To think about for sure. We, we discussed that, right? We discussed that before, right? That it's natural to do that, but we need to build up our children that it shouldn't be the dominating force in their life. That they should care about other people, but it can't control them. What are people going to say about me? And to do that, our children need to build an inner- sense of wealth of like, I'm comfortable with who I am. If someone doesn't like me as I am, I can handle that. Like maybe like I know this completely, but like, that's okay. So, so they think. Like it, it's, it's an avoida, right? But as we talk about Yiddish with Sam Aligim, like it's, it's one of the critical avoidas in Yiddish guide to help our children build resilience against that, that can't control them. And part of that is just building confident kids. Um, they should be the ones who just Feel good about what they're doing and, and assume everyone's going to copy them, of course, with kindness and compassion. But as opposed to the ones who are constantly looking, whatever you know, there are leaders and their followers. Like, we don't want to be the ones who are always hearing what are other people doing, and that tells me um, how I'm going to fit in. Like, it's it's when our children lack that confidence, giving them Yiddish pride is much, much harder, right? Then we're like talking about values. We're, in other words, for all human beings, it's a challenge, we said. But if our children on the spectrum of confidence are further down, that they're the ones kind of worrying what people think of them more, um, it's even harder. So we want to kind of help them be the ones who are just assuming people will copy them because they're doing the right thing and they're, and they're okay. So nuanced. It is nuanced. Um, and I, humility. Right. So I, I want to stop here and explain something that comes up a lot. And that is a concern when we talk about Yiddish pride and peer pressure and whatever, there's a concern people have of if I'm gonna make my child or try to get my child to feel proud of who they are as a yid, as a chassid, um, whatever, right? Whatever level we talk about, if our specific identity and values in our family, the standards we keep, they're gonna be condescending. They're gonna be mean to other kids. They're gonna be judgmental. I don't wanna snob. I don't wanna raise people who look down, kids who are gonna look down at someone else. And we, because of that fear, I think we hesitate to give them a strong sense of like, what you're doing is right. And this is the right way to be. And we're proud of that. Cause we're like, it's by definition, they come together, right? The stronger they're gonna feel about this is the right way. You know, this is the way. So that means they're gonna be judgmental to those who don't learn this or whatever. So like, I can't do that, right? We have to sort of, right? Like blend this kind of, yeah, it's good. It's wonderful, but also everyone's wonderful. and. And we kind of want to leave things a little vague and like just share nice values without giving a sense of this is right and this is MS and this is good and this is the way to do things um, because we're afraid of that. And I want to make a few points. One is um, think of, let's compare it to wealth. Okay. Let's say someone has is benched with a lot of money. So there are two things someone can, um, two ways a person can feel about how much money they have. One, which is very common and very natural in our world, is like the Hebrew expression goes, bal hamea is bal the, mm -hmm. the um hamea, the one with a hundred dollar bill, right? The one with the money is bal -adea. They get to have, not only that, they get to have an opinion on everything. So if you have money, you get to also dictate how chinuch should run, because for sure, you know everything, you know, about 
how schools should run just because you have money or whatever, right? We know that been well and, and lots of other things and politics and whatever and the community and like, you know, you get to tell everyone what to do because you have money, right? So in other words, I'm entitled and better than everybody because I have money. That's one attitude, which of course is ridiculous. And the other attitude, which is Yiddishkeit, is katointi Mikola chasadim, as Yaakov Avinu says. Katointi, the fact that I have so many chasadim, that I have so many brachas in my life, makes me feel small. I'm humbled. What did I do to deserve this? Why do I deserve these brachas? Certainly, if Hashem gave me these brachas, then he intended me to just be a shleif to pass them on to others. That obligates me. I now have more obligation. I need to feel grateful. I need to live up to Hashem's trust in me. Like that's a responsibility. That, that's a healthy Yiddish approach to brachas. As Chassidim used to say about money, does this slice of bread that I have is is yours just as it is mine. Hashem has sent your parnasa through me. If I have an extra slice of bread, it's clearly Hashem just sent it as a, me as a delivery person to pass it on to you. It can't all be for me. So it's yours. Tzedakah, it's the right thing. I'm not like this magnanimous, you know, you have to bend all down and, and, and honor me forever for the tzedakah I gave. It's like, obviously, if I, if I have a little bit extra, it was just intended to, to pass on to those who Hashem gave less. Like that's Hashem, the way Hashem built it. So I think if we take that same approach to the values we want to give our children, um, I think it solves a lot of our problem. And that is when we're talking about values, what does it mean that you're a yid? What does it mean that you're from a yid? Yes, there are other yidin who don't keep mitzvahs or you know many of them and you might see their lifestyle, they're living differently. You're a chassid, you're a labavitcher. We have these or that standards in our home. So does that make you better than anybody? Does that make you an elitist? Does that make you uh, give you the right to judge other people, to look down at them, ask you to lose them? No, that's ridiculous. Why? Because the way we're sharing it is ashrain. We're, we're not better. We're, we've been given a privilege. We are, um, sorry. Um, Ashrena, we're, we're lucky. We've been given a present due to no, um, what do you say, merit of our own. It's not like we deserved it. Like the Erechayim says about the Torah, Hashem didn't give us a Torah because we're better people. Um, he gave it to us out of love. Hashem just, Hashem just decided to choose us. Like, thank you, Hashem. That's an undeserved gift that I've been chosen to be a yid out of everyone. You Hashem chose us, not I anything, it's not me. And no, you chose me that I, I was fortunate to be raised in a home, right? If we're talking about our children. So right, our children are fortunate to, to, to be raised in a home um, of Torah mitzvahs, to be given that chinuch. There are so many Yidin who aren't that fortunate. They don't know about the term of this. And even if they, you think they know, they clearly didn't get it in a positive enough way to, for it to be meaningful to them. So whatever, you're seeing another Yid who's not keeping term of the way we do in our house. Unfortunately for them, they don't get what you have. You're so lucky that you have the chinuch of you have, that you have, and that obligates you, right? Chas, you're not better because you're a chas. It's like, woo, we're us, you know? We're for them, we're Lubavitchers, we're the best. Like, no, we're not. <laughs> Chsidis is Teresa Shel Mashiach. So we are lucky that we've been given the schus to have access to Teresa Shel Mashiach. That just gives us a sense of obligation. But to me, Chasadim, why did we deserve access to this treasure? Only for the purpose of share, sharing it with others. And that should make us feel a sense of obligation. Am I living up to that? Like if a yid without access to Teresa Chsidis can be from and keep a certain standard, then shouldn't much more be expected of me? Like I should be obligated to be just as good and better if I have said this, like I should feel humbled. I should feel, um, right? I should feel like, hold on, wait, I don't measure up. 
this pasnish for a chassid. Like there's, with the schus comes an achrayis, comes, comes more expectations. You know, the same thing for any other standards. If we're transmitting as, it's like wealth. You have been given a bracha. We have been given a bracha. Baruch Hashem, we have this. Ashrena matayv chalpenu. And that means if we've been given this, right, on all levels of identity that we talked about, that means that we're obligated to share it with those who weren't as lucky yet. We need to share it with them. And of course not judge them because like ever, but especially if they don't even have access to what you have, like who do you think you are? Right, it's not a lecture we're saying, but if it's the message, the, the way that we're sharing our values is with the strength of like, this is MS and a yid has been chosen, a yid is Kaddish and everything we said, but it's a privilege, it's we're lucky, it's a bracha, thank you Hashem. You could have not been, right? There are people who don't have this. And we're so lucky that we do. When we talk like that, you can't become condescending from that. You can't become judgmental, right? The, the, the application of that is kotonyi. The application of that is a sense of a chrayis of what am I doing to share the wealth with somebody else? Okay, that's not confidence. Um, a couple more things briefly uh, that connect to that, um, that I think are part of this discussion of helping build like pride and resilience against peer pressure is there is something very powerful about a child identifying positively with their specific family, with their roots. Um, the Rebbe says something incredible, a sikha here from Chela Gimel, that the children, the kinder zolen visna zeir, tatem mamazen in andershvi ala, children need to have a very clear sense that their parents are different than others. We can't just assume that if we're telling them to do things, but like, yeah, we're like everyone and everyone's everyone's the same and everyone does everything, like, then why do I have different standards? Why is it okay for my friends, not okay for me? So where does it come from? They're, the children should pick up, yes, my parents are different. The Rebbe says, Andre Freund's and Angeton Nidritz needs to take a there. There may be mothers who dress in many different ways, but my mother, they should feel proud of their mother. My mother dresses Sneasta. Let them notice that. Let them know. We'll talk about how we can get them to know it. But like, let them realize my mommy's special. She's extra careful about this. My tati, there are not, not every tati is careful to be honest in business above above. My tati is always very careful. We can, you know, apply that to lots of different things. Let them know what makes their parents special. Um, there's a lot of place for humility in Yiddish guide. I don't think in front of our children is the place for it. <laughs> children should be proud of their parents. And they, Believe us. One second. So first of all, I think personally, uh, the smartest way to do it is not to tell them yourself, but to tell about the other spouse. Like tell them about all the special things their tati does and how amazing he is. And they will want to live up to their tati and let the tati tell the children about how special their mommy is. Like in that way, I, I think it comes across a lot better than bragging let them find out, right? Like I remember one time that my son came home. I don't remember how old he was, maybe like eight or something like that. And he had been with my husband on the street and they stopped, uh, they met a boy who my husband knew to be the child of someone who's very involved in the Bob doing lots of good things. And he said like, oh, you're so-and-so, you have such a special tati. Anyway, a minute later, they moved on. Hours later, my son comes home who's so-and-so, we met him near whatever, he lives near such and such, whatever, I finally figured out who it was. And Tati told him that he has a very special Tati. Why is this Tati special? So I explained to him and he says, is our Tati also special? And it was just so precious because it was like, wait, hold on. Of course your Tati is special. How do you not know that? So I like, you know, but like, you don't know what the adults know or whatever. Like you only know them as Tati or you only know what your mommy's doing. You don't know what your parents are doing. So it was my opportunity to share with him like some of the really special things his Tati does and why you should feel proud of his Tati. But if we don't make sure our children know that, they don't have a clue. They might just see us being busy. They don't know why we're busy. We just left them at a certain period of time. And like, oh, he's doing stuff. How do I know what she's doing, right? Like let them find out, find someone to tell them, but like let them know what their parents do so they, they feel proud and want to emulate their, their parents. They feel like, oh, I belong to this really special family. And we all have what to give our children, but like, let them have that. And if we have Bubby Zabies, um, if we're lucky to have anyone that they can look at in their uh, family tree to emulate, like let them know about it. Let them know how special their Bubby Zabie 
whoever was and why um, develop a connection to that because there's something about the sense of like, my family's different. So even if other families do something else in our home, and then they feel good about when we tell them, which we need to tell them at some point when they say, but other, how come other kids, whatever, but everyone else says, mommy, by the way, we're still waiting to find out who everyone else is and meet that everyone else. Um, but everyone else does, and we can just tell them in our home, we do, you know, in our home, the rules are in our home, we do such and such. But if they have a sense of our home's a special home, like we have special parents and we have a special family. So when we say in our home, we do that, it's like, okay, I'm good with that. Like, I'm, I'm proud to be part of this family. So I want to do what this family does, but they, they kind of have to have that. And then we can build on in our home is different. There ever brings this from an example of Yaakov Avinu that he lived in Haran, which was Haran Afshalaylam and people were doing all kinds of things. And Reuven went out, we make Tzirchitim, it says, he went out at the time of the harvest. There was stuff growing all over, anyone could take it. Anyone else in Haran who would find themselves in the field would happily take whatever they want from the harvest. And he brings home duda and wildflowers that just, you know, that are hefker, like no one cares. They're just the stuff that's growing on the side. And he brings them home to his mother and, and to Ro, right? Um, Rachel asked for them, whatever, that whole story. So Rashi points out, why do we need to know that he went out at the time of the harvest? Point out, realize what it means that Yaakov was raising children in Haran. And no one around them would blink about stealing. And Reuven goes out and only takes Dudaim because it was very obvious to all of Yaakov Avinu's children, we are different. This is not about being condescending to other people. It's not about talking about them. It's about what we are. What we're, yes, what we stand for. In our family, we stand for this. We stand for Torah values. We don't steal. So other people say, so they steal. What's got to do with me? Nothing to do with me. These are not the values of my home. These are not the values of Yaakov, of, you know, my father. That's not, that's not, that's not who I follow. And they were able to, all the children, Beniflinu, the sense of, of we're different. And if someone is doing something different, so they're doing it. So what? In my family, we do something else. And I would point out one more thing, if we feel like this is not enough in terms of condescending or whatever, and maybe it will bring a certain sense of pride. Um, I'm gonna copy all the sources here, but there's another um, amazing source from the Rebbe that I just saw. Um, a little piece where the Rebbe writes that when it comes to children, there are some things that are natural to children. There's a certain competitiveness. There's a certain one-upmanship, you know, or must try to be the better one and whatever and competition that's gonna exist anyway. So um, it's important to harness it in the right direction. And at the same time, you have to teach them to decide this. Like at the same time, you have to work on whatever you have to work on, but it's like peer pressure is not gonna disappear because we don't teach values somehow. Like if it's not, um, if it's not kina seifrim, if it's not peer pressure over like how much, uh, I don't know, how much Tyra I'm learning or whatever, um, then it's peer pressure over which sneakers I have. Like, let's be real, there's gonna be peer pressure anyway. So it's just, taking that energy and putting it into positive places. And at the same time, um, you know, Midas Tevis, we have to work on it. We'll talk about that more next time. Like we're not free from the obligation to teach Midas Tevis, but there's no contradiction. It doesn't have to be a contradiction. They have to feel proud of who they are and what their family stands for and, and know their values and feel proud of good about those values. And we have to teach them Midas Tevis and humility and everything else, but not shy away from giving them clarity and confidence. This is what our family does because we're afraid of, you know, hasvashalom, they're gonna judge someone. Like you, you can't live like that. Which brings me to the last point, and then I'll maybe open up for a few minutes. And that is that um, it's very helpful, I think, when it, we come to peer pressure. Um, we talked before about confidence and are they the leaders or the followers to find a way to make our children into leaders, um, specifically in Yiddishkeit. Like to give them an opportunity to be the shliach whether it's they're doing something for younger children or teaching something to their younger siblings or um, getting involved in some sort well, of or giving or like there's so many opportunities to do that and different things work for different families. But finding a way our children can be givers and shlokim and see themselves as shlokim. Because like the rule in halacha is when you're, um, right, when you're giving out, you can't, um, you can't absorb. Um, when there are people all around us doing different things, 
either we're the followers, so we're just looking at, you know, it affects us, or we're in a position that we're thinking about just what can we give to others? What can we share with others? And when you're busy sharing light, first of all, there's the confidence. But second of all, you're oh my goodness. busy thinking about so what- So I forgot I have to wash my shape though. When you're busy giving light, it's, it's very hard to, um, to be distracted by what other people have to give to me. You're just in a, in a different mode. And that's the whole concept of shluchos. Like normally, uh, the Perky Yavis says, Perkvah, about Rabbi Yaisi ben Kisma, that he was walking in the road and a man came to him and said, Fogabi Adam, he beats him and he says, you know, Rabbi, where do you come from? I'm going to pay you a fortune. I'll give you pearls and jewels and, and gold and silver. Come live in our town because we don't have any like B'nai Tyra there. And he recognized that basically they're using him as a token, like you'll be the, you'll be the one doing Yiddishkeit there and then we'll rely on you. And he said, I'm sorry, like you can pay me all the money in the world. I, I'm staying in a good environment. I, I'm not like, you're not going to buy me out uh, to live in a place where there isn't a supportive Yiddish environment. Um, for exchange of money, like totally tarus picha me alpiz of chesed, and we think like you know the story is a contradiction to shluchas. Like we don't believe in this, but the truth is we do. Shluchas is a. Um, I'll conclude with this. Shluchas is an exception. The concept that you take a young couple, send them out to a town where there there isn't much in the way of active Yiddishkeit, right? Where people are living a very secular lifestyle. There isn't from chinuch for their children. There isn't like there isn't even many initially. Like what are you thinking? And this is not, we don't do this in Yiddishkeit. Like a Yid has to live in a place where there are, there is an environment that supports their Yiddishkeit. Al to be in we're not allowed to put ourselves in a compromised situation like that. And the answer is first and foremost, of course, the Kayach of the Mashaleach. Um, moreover, on, on a, like on a level that we can understand, um, the Rebbe is sending you out with a mission. The Rebbe's not sending you out to just sort of be there. If we go, we're just like, oh, I'm here because I like, you know, whatever, fill in the blank place. It's a good place to live. We're going to be affected. But if we go out with my mission is to share what I have with everyone else, I'm here to change the place. It's a lot less likely the place will change me as long as I'm actually plugged in and, and really, really in tune with and, and don't forget about what my mission is. And the same thing is for our children, no matter where we live. Um, I think even if we live in a firm community, even if we live in Crown Heights, wherever we live, like we need to think about like, how are we giving our children a sense of we're shluchem, we're shluchem to something. We're shluchem for some, there's some mitzvah that we're, you know, there all, there's a lot for the taking, by the way. <laughs> there, there's lots of shluchas opportunities to, to be done. There's so much we could be involved in and sharing and giving. They can be a role model to their friends of, of whatever, what, whatever specific mitzvah or midah or terror learning or something that we're like, right, giving them strongly. There's always a way that they can be a positive leader. And if they're thinking like that, and they're thinking in terms of like, how do I, how do I give the special things that I have? Um, I think we really strengthen them to be less vulnerable to what everyone says. Like, no, but I'm just like, you know, like, right. So the kids are new, so they don't know. So like, what am I going to do to, to share it with them? What am I going to do to teach them as opposed to somehow I just... I follow them. So those are just some um, thoughts. I'm sure there's more, but um, you know, maybe areas that we can think about that can help us strengthen our children, that they know who they are, where they're going, why, um, and that they should be, they should be shlochem, that they should be the leaders. Neris loha ir lamp lighters, that's what I writes in the, the letter to a bas mitzvah, right? That you should, what is the Rebbe's message to a bas mitzvah? That you should be a dut machaya. To others, I'm talking about like when they're adults. Like the bracha for you is that you should find a way to see yourself as an example to others, and of course, in a positive way, how you can um, radiate to others what it means to be a basro, bas chabad, and that they're going to follow you. Maybe you're not saying anything. Maybe you're just happily doing what you're doing, and they're going to copy you. But like that's the message we want our children to get. All right, your thoughts. <laughs> Getting late. Kind of big key is the intention, like you were saying, imparting values. It takes time to pause and think, like, yes. what are the values that I want to impart? Then exactly. You're, then you're more equipped to share it. Precisely. I think that the biggest challenge we want to run up with in anything we want to strengthen in our chinuch is always time. It's like, why don't we have time? Um, and, and I think, first of all, it's true. Like, let's recognize it's very challenging to find time. We're not crazy. We're not 
dysfunctional. We're not the worst parents ever that we're finding ourselves struggling with time, right? It's, it's the nature of the very busy world we live in. And yet, um, think about how much more time it would take after there's an issue and we're trying to figure it out than proactively for bringing with our children. Um, and it's, you know, we sometimes need to be creative, sit down with our husband and figure out like, what can he do? What can I do? What can we do together? What could happen on shops? What, you know, it doesn't always have to be so long, but yes, it doesn't happen without making some time for it. And sometimes it requires a sacrifice. I think like, wait, like what, what are we going to realign in our home that there is some time for this to happen? Um, it's not easy. Definitely not easy. All, all, it's all back to the half an hour day about thinking of the chenach of our children. I think part of the half hour day is, is thinking about the values that they are. Like, wait, what values do we want our children to have? How do we want them to look at whatever, right? We're noticed they're being mean to other kids and whatever it is, like, how do we want to teach them to look at other yidin? How do we want them to look at money? How do we want them to think of sneeze? Whatever, like, how do we want them to see Tyra learning? Um, what issues have we noticed? Wait, what are our values? What do we believe, believe about this? What messages are we giving off? How would we transmit them to our children? And like a lot, a lot of it is, is the strategizing. But there's no, isn't much of a shortcut to. One thing you said about freezing the spouse. We do that at the Shabbos table, but you think it's just Oh, that's great. So that's that is so great. It's just Kyle, freezing the spouse. Yes, it's such a good issue value. That's a, that's a great example. Um, Yes, I think it's, a, and it's such a healthy thing for Shalom bias and for everything. Yes. That's so, precisely. That is such a great point. You know, if you use that properly, the whole conservation style, like Tara's teaching us to model, like how do you raise children? Yes, in front of everybody. Thank you, mommy. What a beautiful shop. So what an incredible mommy we have. Like, it's not even like about specific, um, they do this, they do that. Like simply the act of complimenting the spouse in front of the children and pointing out, you know, wow, they, what a delicious supper mommy always makes, whatever, you know, like we're, we're teaching them Mida is just, just from that. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great point. I love that. I do think that self-confidence is valuable. It's a completely different thing. You're teaching your kids how to your value of what you think in Yiddish say, he did that, versus teaching self-confidence. Like, that's true. They are totally different things. Um, I'm loving them together because we don't have um, it's a limited, limited series, and I think they're they're just connected in that both of them are critical to give our children Yiddish right. Okay. In other words, on the one hand, they need to know our values, but they also need to be raised to be confident children. Otherwise, all the speeches in the world and barbarians and whatever, when they're feeling insecure, it's not enough. So, right, there's no connection between the two, but I think they need both. That's just my opinion. For sure. Yeah, 100%. All right, anyone else? Do we have something on here? I don't see anything more. Chat. Something in the chat. What practical ways would you suggest doing this with varied ages and abilities to sit and talk, so to speak, besides part time and seeing their crafts? Um, yeah, what about babies and very young kids? Shops are very hectic. Okay, so those are similar questions, and those are great questions. Someone wanted to add to that. Sorry. How do you manage a two out of four year olds? Who like want to talk for a half hour about a question sheet, <laughs> and then there are like the 25 year olds who don't all like to do Right. So. Um, okay, great questions. First of all, about the little children, obviously, I think this increases more as they get older. I mean, there, there is an amount that we can expect a little child to consciously sit and listen to, and there's an amount that isn't, and not necessarily does that mean you should have a three year old have to listen to our speeches, and some of this applies more as they get a little older than that. And for younger children, it comes across in smaller ways and things that were slipping throughout the day in the books that we choose to read. Um, I mean, most young children love books and they're a very good thing for many reasons to do with our children. And the Rebbe says, take advantage. Like when you're reading stories and books to your children, bedtime stories or whatever it is, um, like choose wisely. So if you're reading to them, I don't know, the label and Yossi series or something, you've got a lot of mileage out of, what you're reading instead of just like stupid things. Um, and that's that's the way to share values that way. Like you just, like, I think there's, I believe there's a source I saw off the Rebbe that chinuch until about age five is primarily through stories. So they don't necessarily have to happen all at the Shabbos table. I mean, tell stories whenever, just choose good stories. And when it comes to Shabbos table, there can be different rules for like children under a certain age. They may not even be up 
part of the Friday night Suda. They might sit for half an hour at the Shabbos Suda and go off and play and we talk to the older kids. Like, you know, that's okay. We don't have to make little kids do something that's not age appropriate. Um, listen to long lectures. Like, I, I think that's, that's fine. It's more, it's for little children. like, think of it like preschool, right? Preschool will look very different than um, second grade. You're not gonna sit in a desk listening to you for hours. You're more like there's 10 minute circle time. There's like a, a snorry time and then there's whatever. And then there are little comments you make during lunch. Like, and, and that's the way we're doing it on that age level. And that's, that's fine. But the Shabbos table is still, Shabbos table still feels meaningful. And of course, as they get older, there's more. As far as the balancing, like giving the younger children attention and adults, like I think the first thing is our own confidence that like, first and foremost, the priority at the Shabbos table, unless it's a specific, you know, there are exceptions. We're hosting a specific guest, we're looking to give attention and we know our children have the other Shabbos meal or most Shabbos meals and whatever, and we can afford to do that. But for the most part, the Shabbos table belongs to the children, period. Like we start from that place. You come and join, like you need to respect that. Everyone, the child is getting their attention now. We are reading their partial thing. We're whatever. Of course, you can say we don't do the whole thing, which is part of it to do Friday night, part of it to do Shabbos day, part of it to do with mommy on the couch after lich benshin, part of it to do whatever. You don't, you don't do the whole thing. You could choose to give the child to, but the child needs their whatever number of minutes of attention that we're giving them. And every child's different. Some kids need more and some kids need less. And the time that we're giving them, it's it's perfectly reasonable to ask people to respect that. Like right now, we're excuse me, like we speak, this is our home. There are children, they're the priority, and and everyone else can wait. And they can learn a lot from our interactions with our children and what our children are sharing and the story that they're saying, or the song that they're singing, or whatever. And if they don't want it, so don't come, honestly. But um, but as I said, like sometimes we're it's not totally practical and it and and guests dominate what's going on and we can't control it. So that's where we have some and some, and children to know, like you'll, tomorrow, you know, tomorrow is the kind of meal and we'll do more of it then. And for tonight, just something shorter. You know, I think it's balancing what's, what does a child really need? Some children need to be given a limit. Like, okay, we're, we're done. Someone else needs a turn. Um, you know, but is it coming from a place of my child is asking for too much attention that's not, um, that's not realistic and they don't actually need right now? Or is it coming from a place of like fear of like, wait, my guests are going to be bored and whatever. So like, seriously, <laughs> you're joining a Shabbos table for a reason, right? So it's okay to listen to the children's parsha and to throw in some comments here and there, cater to the adults as we read a question and we like stick in something that, um, you know, that's more interesting or a higher level for the adults and move back to the child. You know, there's a way to navigate it. But I think we, um, we need not be so worried. Kind of like there's a sense of almost like okay kids be quiet like we have guests to entertain like what's gonna happen let, let them see a Yiddish family like let them get let I mean I know maybe 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 I'm a little extreme about this but um in general I find that my my children look forward to guests um Baruch Hashem one of the big reasons is guests means more attention not less it means more people to listen to your things and and give you attention so like you know great you don't want to give my child attention so this is not the shabbos meal for you again it doesn't have to be the whole time it could be first course first course is centered on the kids at some point they're off they're done you know you'll stay later we'll talk to the guests like it's okay you can wait right okay thank you everyone for joining us Aslaha told us for bringing with our children and uh, um we should have nachas from them that it says like uh not that like the Rebbe says that usually children think like whatever my parents are i can i can be half of that um but you know the opposite that whatever values we're trying to live that our children should pick them up in a way that they can even live them stronger than we do Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.